Welcome, everyone. I am really excited to see everyone here tonight. This is going to be a great event. I'm Eleanor Feingold. I'm the Dean of the College of Science for everyone I haven't met yet, which is a few of you. Um, I want to welcome everyone to the college's second annual Inclusive Excellence Lecture. Um, before we get started, I would like to formally acknowledge the impact that Oregon State's land-grant history has had on indigenous communities. The land-grant colleges were created by the Morrill Act of 1862, which cleared the way for that by the seizure of nearly 11 million acres of land from 250 sovereign tribal nations. Oregon State was one of those, of course. It's located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River Band of the Kalapuya, who were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of those people are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Salish Indians, some of whom are part of OSU community today. We deeply value their presence and their contributions to the university and to the College of Science. Recognition of those contributions is an important part of the college's um, commitment to equity, to justice, and to inclusive excellence. And so it's a really important part of what we want to think about tonight as we talk about these efforts. In the College of Science, we believe that science should be by and for all of us, informed by a wide variety of perspectives, backgrounds, and experiences. We, I hope, are striving to embed inclusive excellence, principles of equity and justice in everything we do. This event is obviously a testament to that. Um, the college launched our actual Inclusive Excellence Award in 2019 to recognize outstanding work of faculty, staff, and students in advancing inclusive excellence at OSU. Last year, this award was expanded to include this lecture, uh, which provides a way to give a more public view and really involve more people in thinking about these issues and looking at the great work that's being done in the college. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take that as a cheer. <laughs> I don't want to go on for too long, though. I want to now invite the college's directory, director for equity, access, and inclusion, Cameron Kaduka, to come say a few words. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dean Feingold, for uh, that introduction. Um, I am very excited to be here and to welcome you all because this is actually my first Inclusive Excellence uh, lecture. Being able to attend this lecture last year, you all got a video of me, but this year you get like the real deal. So um, I'm very excited. Um, but tonight really is an opportunity for us to acknowledge the great work that is happening within the College of Science that is taking place over the last year, and then to also celebrate our Inclusive Excellence winner. All across the college, in ways that impacts faculty, students, staff, work is being done to increase equity, access, and inclusion, making the College of Science a better place for folks to learn, grow, and belong. The college is implementing and launching new initiatives and programs. Individual faculty are learning and implementing what they learn into curriculum redesign to make their classes more inclusive. Departments are making systemic changes to make their processes and policies and procedures more equitable and accessible for students and their employees. At all the levels that this is happening, this work has true impact. Tonight, I wanna to focus a bit on that impact. I believe that impact is truly what matters we can go through the motions, we can say the right words, but if the work we are doing doesn't have impact, change will never come. Tonight, I wanna to highlight three different programs and initiatives um, and talk about the ways that these, these programs have had impact um, on our students, on our faculty, and our community. First, the Gender Equity Leadership Fund. This new funding opportunity supports the advancement of faculty members who previously or currently identify as women. It is aimed at enhancing and building leadership skills and opportunities for these faculty members in the college. And in its first year, we awarded three awards of $3,000 each to three proposals. This past December, LSR Barber, uh, the department head for biochemistry and biophysics, presented Women Leaders in STEM Challenges and Rewards. This event brought Angela Gorenborn, head of the Department of Structural Biology at the University of Pittsburgh, to our campus, um, where she spoke about her investment in mentorship and sponsorship of women in science throughout her career. A panel discussion followed with several key women scientists, uh, science leaders at Oregon State. Panel members included Vice President for Research, Ram Tumor, College of Science Dean, 
uh, Eleanor Feingold, and College of Agricultural Sciences Dean Stacey Simonich. Advisor Katie Keene and Head Advisor Jenna Lara also received a Gender Equity Leadership Fund Award to develop and host an in-person experience that supports faculty and staff and professional faculty and staff who currently or previously identify as women. A guest speaker will lead participants in se sessions focused on empowerment, work-life balance, leadership at all levels, connecting personal values to College of Science values, and a climate of creating belonging and support. worked. Um, in the Department of Chemistry, Marilyn Makowitz, Associate Professor, and Paula Weiss, Senior Instructor Two's Award will support a specialized mentorship program for women instructors, professors, and researchers in the department. Called Catalyst, the goal of the program is to cultivate an environment that shapes the next generation of leaders, scientists, mentors, and educators. Participants will formulate their career goals and develop a range of skills um, such as effective grant writing, finding sources of funding, and inclusive leadership skills. Makowitz and Weiss are already seeing an impact from the Catalyst. Both have seen a change in culture that has created space for faculty to work together, address challenges, and be supported. The second initiative that I would like to talk about tonight is the Leonardo Scholarship. Made possible by generous donations from mathematics alum Judy Fawcett, the Leonardo Scholarship provides emergency aid to LGBTQ plus students in the College of Science who experience sudden extreme circumstances or life events. Jointly administered by the College of Science and the OSU Pride Center, initiatives like this go a long way in supporting some of our most vulnerable students. Although LGBTQ students make up roughly 10% of the student population, it is estimated that they account for 25 to 50% of the homeless population here at OSU. The impact of scholarships like this are not just financial for an individual, but also let students know that we as a community care about them and are ready to support them when others have not. The third program I would like to highlight tonight is Launching Undergraduate Research Experiences. Launching Undergraduate Research is the college's newest undergraduate research program and provides a year-long paid research opportunity to students who have historically not had access to research, um, undergraduate research. Priority is also given to students who have not done undergraduate research and are in the last two years of their bachelor's degree here at OSU. Research shows that undergraduate students, or undergraduate research is a high impact practice and is highly correlated with retention in higher education. Uh, that trend and that effect is also stronger for populations um, that hold marginalized identities. Led by Gabs James, Associate Director for Student Engagement, they're also part of a cohort of students engaging in professional development opportunities throughout the academic year, and they will also present research in the spring term of their project. For many of our students, family obligations and the need to work and other circumstances put summer undergraduate research experiences out of reach. Launching undergraduate research provides access to paid research opportunities for these students. Without it, these students wouldn't have the same access to building confidence in themselves, building their resumes, and building their skills. While this is just a small sample of the encouraging work that is being done, it is representative of the impact that this work has. Other ongoing projects include moving forward with the college, uh, with moving forward with collecting College of Science specific climate data and conducting a review of student experiences to inform how the college will meet the prosperity widely shared target of increasing six year graduation, graduation rates to 80% and more specifically equalizing those graduation rates. You can also look for opportunities in the near future to participate in a new campaign called This is What a Scientist Looks Like to further broaden the image of a scientist within our community. While there is always more work to do, I am proud of the impact that this community has had and look forward to seeing the impact that our future work will have. Um, I would now like to welcome our Associate Professor Senior Research Kirsten Grorud Culvert to present her lecture entitled Inclusive Science gathering community for dialogue and action. Grorud Culvert, who arrived at Oregon State in 2006, has been an, an integral part of the de Department of Integrative Biology's efforts to create an equity, justice, and inclusion committee value statement. She organized a discussion retreat attended by 83 members of the department community, allowing more voices to be heard and incorporated. She also prioritizes inclusive excellence in her role as a marine ecologist, she focuses on place-based approaches to understand the local impacts of marine protected areas in different parts of the world while integrating the perspectives of local communities and historically marginalized populations. 
Please welcome the 2023 College of Science Inclusive Excellence Award recipient, Kirsten Garud Colbert. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Here we go. Um, thank you, Dean Feingold. Oh, yes. Um, let me bring up my thing here. Um, I'm so happy to see you all tonight. Thank you for the time that you're giving to be here. Thank you. Ooh. The mouse is not working. Oh, everything ran so smoothly like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> OK. Uh, here we go. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there we go. Ta da. Yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you to Dean Feingold and Cameron for the welcome and the introduction. Um, thank you to all of you for being here. It is Dinner time on a Thursday, so your time and being here says a lot about the college's commitment to this work and all of your passion for it as well. So thank you for being here. And I really want to start with gratitude. Um, to be awarded um, this opportunity is incredibly humbling. A little terrifying because I'm not an expert in this topic, but super passionate about it and grateful for the opportunity to talk with you about it. Um, also, I want to say uh, thank you to Dee Denver, who is our department head. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is based on work happening in integrative biology. What an incredible community of people and Dee as our head is creating the space for these conversations and I'm really grateful. Um, I also want to say thank you to my mentors here at OSU. You know who you are. And in preparing for this talk and also just this work, the mistakes, the things that don't work, the things that do, um, being able to discuss those things with you um, make all the difference, so thank you. Um, I want to thank my family who's here in the front row, my husband and my two kids, Amelia and Violet, because of course all of us sit here today with these communities behind us that support us and lift us up and um, having two teenagers. Amazing to see how that generation, right, is already laughing us um, in many things, including the topics we're going to talk about today, so really grateful for that. And then I also want to just express so much gratitude to the community of IB. This is us, and this is my home here in the College of Science. Uh, this was taken at the start of fall term. What an incredible community of people uh, committed to this work, um, the ups and the downs of this work. We're going to talk a little bit about that today, but just so grateful. Um, for all the different people in this department and the different roles and perspectives that they're bringing. So um, I'm a marine ecologist, like was mentioned. Um, I'm going to bring a couple different aspects of my identity um, to you today. Um, I am a woman. I'm a wife. I'm a mother. I'm a swimmer. I was born in the desert. Um, I'm a person of faith. I'm a scientist. And um, the opportunity to consider these in preparing this talk today has also been wonderful. So thank you for that. So <clears throat> it's the evening time. We've all probably had long work days. Um, we wear a lot of hats, each and every one of us. And so I thought, you know, this isn't a science talk, not a lot of graphs. How can we have this conversation together? And I thought, let's, let's tell some stories. And so today, kind of have the intention of uh, telling three different stories during our time together about integrative biology, about the ocean, about conservation, and about the future. So um, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. 
So uh, the first story is about integrative biology, near and dear to my heart. Um, and this story starts in a room. It's um, both a small room and a big room. Um, I would hazard a guess that every single one of us has been in this room, um, maybe even today. And um, a lot of the world started showing up in this room around 2020. And that room is a Zoom room. <laughs> and um, this story starts in a Zoom room because we, in the Department of Integrative Biology, found ourselves in a position in 2021, we're spending a lot of time in these Zoom rooms, and for this particular committee that had just um, been formed, we were about to spend a lot of time together in Zoom. And this was a really interesting time for our department, kind of a crossroads time. Um, EGI work in our department was not new, um, had been ongoing for years in, uh, the efforts of individual faculty, the community, the department, the heads over time. And that took various forms. We had an incubator committee that um, brainstormed different immediate actions we could take um, to bring more equity, to um, take a hard look at representation in our community, and our faculty, make some changes. Um, we also had an EGI community, uh, committee that did a, um, a climate survey. And that climate survey had some really interesting, but also some really tough things that came from it. Um, anonymized comments that were really unearthing the reality of a lot of things happening. You know, a lot of people with good intentions, but in reality, you know, people um, had suffered some harm. And it was a time when we were all kind of considering that and focusing on it and trying to figure out how to move forward. And then the pandemic. So on top of everything else, we were isolated, we were fractured, we were all living our daily lives, trying to figure out how to do that and survive. And so many of us had a really wide spectrum of what we were surviving during that time. So we found ourselves in Zoom. And then of course, in 2020, the murder of George Floyd. So. There was so much to be processing um, and a really important time to come together. So that's the start of this story. And these are some of the key players. This is the Integrative Biology EJI Values Committee. And many of them are here. And what an incredible group of people representing a lot of different roles and responsibilities in our department, a lot of different career stages, a lot of different um, perspectives. And it was up to us to think about how can we, in this moment, coalesce community, talk about our shared values, and move forward, because shared values should be guiding all our actions in this space. And so we had some ideas about that. We knew we wanted the process to embody some very important things. We knew we wanted to approach this with truth, with honesty with justice, with courage to have these conversations about tough things happening in the sciences, in academia, in our department, for our community members. Um, we also wanted to approach it with compassion and with um, humility, with empathy, with teamwork, and we wanted to create a space for that. And so to do that, we also thought a lot about process. I like thinking about process as a scientist. And we knew that we wanted to be transparent. Everyone in the department should know this is what's happening. This is how you can engage. These are the steps that we're going to take. We knew that we wanted to create an environment that was safe and welcoming. The reality is that in any department, in any um, system, you have different roles and different power structures. And that creates realities for the kinds of conversations you can have and the feeling of safety to be able to have those conversations. So we wanted to have some conversations um, within groups, some among groups, and to create that space. We wanted to build community. What an important time to do that, and IB's community is amazing. We wanted to continue to hold on to that touchstone and to work together. And we wanted to be product-driven. The end goal was a community value statement, which, you know, at this point in time, and even a year prior, we were seeing a lot of those, a lot of statements, a lot of diversity statements. 
We do want to end up in that, but we also wanted to have the process that would support that and some products along the way. So we thought, let's have everyone develop their own diversity statement so that we're using our own words, our own convictions, and our own commitments for this work. And we wanted to have multiple steps so that the community had plenty of time to respond, to give feedback, to um, be able to really absorb, and also to participate, because people were living with a lot of different realities during that time. So that's what we set out to do. And our timeline um, seems so long ago now, but just a couple years ago, um, started in the fall term. And we realized that as a community of scientists, first and foremost, that's how we're trained. We're actually, in a lot of ways, not trained to have these kind of conversations. What language do we use? How do we make sure that we're using best practices and supporting people and creating spaces of um, kindness and forgiveness, but also accountability? Um, so we needed some strategy session uh, about how to do that and also some training. Um, we knew we wanted to gather the whole community as best we can. And Cameron even alluded to that, actually a huge number of people on Zoom having this conversation um, in ways that we tried to do in person in the past, but needed to find you know, a way to move forward. And then we invited everyone to, after the training, after the dialogue, develop their own personal diversity statements. And it could be anything. It could be a personal statement, a lab statement. It could be a syllabus statement, a job um, application statement but we encouraged everyone to develop it themselves in their own words. And we even said, try not to use the words equity, justice, and inclusion as much as possible. Right? Use your own words for these super important concepts and commitments. And then we used those, and we invited people to turn them in if they wanted to. Um, they could be anonymized. And then we used that to actually um, generate the first draft of the community value statement. And um, in the end, the whole community had the opportunity to comment on that, which many people did. Interesting comments. And sometimes we had to have follow-up discussions. Um, and then we posted it on our website. And all with these kind of things um, in mind. So for us, you can tell I like process. I just took eight minutes to talk through exactly every step that we took. But really, um, for this approach, the process was just as important as the product and um, the time and effort that the committee and the community put into it um, really exemplified them. So I wanted to share, um, you can't read all of them, but these are some of the statements that we got and so incredible. And preparing for this talk and just going back and reading them, I, I, want, I, want, I want to just read a bit of one. Um, this is from a course diversity statement. Um, it said, I hope that this course strengthens your science identity and instills you with the certainty that no matter your background, you belong in this discipline. I still kind of get goosebumps when I read that because what a powerful statement and what an opportunity. I mean, students, other people who want to join our community, they can navigate to the website. They can see the community value statement, which I'll share in a second. But then they're also going to see peppered throughout the community these commitments to diversity and thoughtful approaches about how to do that. I love the one on the top left. It says, not all students have the same degree of academic preparation or have had access to resume building experiences as others. Resumes do not always reflect potential. So true. Not everyone is comfortable doing field work, and not everyone faces the same risks in remote areas. What an important statement to be made. So all of these you know, resulted from that training and that dialogue and you know, still are really impactful to me. Because in the end, words matter. And we know that. We're very precise in the words that we use as scientists. The same you know, should be our lens when we're welcoming people into our community. So in the end, our community values are online. And I actually won't take much time to go through the words themselves because you know, the process um, is kind of my focus today. But in the end, um, this statement was generated by the community. And the feeling of that is pretty amazing. But in the end, it's also just words. And we had multiple members of the community who held us accountable. They said, we've spent X number of months working on words. What are we going to do with them? And of course, that is the goal. and. 
um, the responsibility. So um, how are shared values guiding the way forward? How are they turning into action? I had a lot of fun creating this figure, but I can tell you that it's incredible to see how those guiding principles are being applied as a lens to the work that we do. So our grad students' experiences. We've been working on developing a holistic emissions policy to address some of the things that were mentioned in these personal diversity statements. Um, a new grad curriculum for our undergrad experience. Um, many, if not most of us, have been taking a hard look at our classes and thinking about how we can incorporate some of these community values into our teaching. Our identity, um, we had a huge process to look at our faculty hiring um, approaches and a committee that did a deep dive into ours, but also best practices from other um, universities and um, opportunities. And it resulted in the hiring of some new faculty in our department um, with a focus on increasing representation. We also have been having some interesting conversations about research. And I want to give a couple of examples um, before I move on to that. Um, just a couple from things that I know, but as I said, lots of things going on in our department. Um, for undergrad experience, um, my co-instructor, Hatai Singh Supin, is here. And um, we teach an eCampus class. And what an incredible opportunity our university has and is making the most of with our eCampus. Um, the ability to provide access for so many students. We have students who are first generation college students. We have students who are homebound, who have to take classes from home. We have students who are active military servicemen and women who are taking our eCampus class. So um, the equity and inclusion that's provided by eCampus is an amazing opportunity. Um, there's still some challenges you have to, um, as an eCampus student, you know, meet some specific um, requirements at times to be able to engage in that kind of learning. So we went through a process to make sure our class had universal design principles. Anyone could take the class and have access to it. For example, if you don't have sight, you can still use a screen reader to access all um, aspects of the class. We have, pre along with DAS, we have pre-created topographic um, graphs that can be shared with students that need them. It's incredible trying to create these things and learning about universal design through that. And eCampus really provides those opportunities along with DAS. We also, um, this is Megan Wilson, a former grad student in the department. And um, she worked on this class to bring in aspects of anti-racist curriculum. For example, during the pandemic, we had an amazing opportunity to have Dr. Tyrone Hayes give a seminar from UC Berkeley about amphibian declines and environmental racism and social justice. And so we developed a whole um, kind of module for the students, a group project for them to discuss that and really look at those links between ecology um, and racism and justice. We also had a decolonizing science discussion group. And so some of my co-organizers are in here, but this was a summer series um, where we really dived into some of these aspects that you see on the right. Um, so many pieces of our work, and I'm an ecologist, so as our um, ecology discipline um, interacts with, so many different ways that decolonizing is absolutely imperative because of some of the harms and the violence and the appropriation that have happened um, just as a result of conducting research. So I wanna put a little bit of a pin in that because I think it's time to move on to our next story. So uh, this is a story of ocean conservation. I am a marine ecologist and um, for this story, we're gonna go underwater. And we're gonna go underwater to the reefs of the Florida Keys. Um, Wish we were there right now. It's not as rainy, probably. Uh, the water is a lot warmer, I can tell you that for sure. Um, but in this place, um, I used to spend a lot of time. And you might think, maybe you have a favorite hike, right? And you do it so often that when you're falling asleep at night, if you wanted to, you could close your eyes and do the hike in your mind because you know it so well. And this is what these reefs were to me um, during the time that I was doing my research there. 
so many hours spent underwater in these places, getting to know them and seeing things over time. And um, what an incredible privilege, I mean, to be able to do that, to be able to engage in this kind of research. First of all, I had to know how to swim. I had to have the benefit of pools, parents who took me to learn how to swim growing up in Tucson, Arizona. Um, also, to do this kind of work, you have to have access to the supplies. These kind of things are not cheap. And a lot of the startup to do this work requires you to buy it. Um, and also then, of course, getting out and getting expertise, taking the class. So being able to be underwater, um, a privilege. And over time, became really clear what a responsibility it was as well, because the reefs were changing. You would see coral heads. Um, being damaged in a moment by careless fishermen. You would see um, invasive species moving in. You'd see coral colonies bleach. I mean, the oceans were changing before my eyes and um, the responsibility to talk about it ended up weighing really heavily on me. I spent a lot of time in these places, and I also spent a lot of time studying these places and documenting some of the things um, that I was talking about. Um, I work a lot with fishes during their early life and the different variability during times of their life, and in the end, what an impact that variability can have. And I spent a lot of time studying them. During this time, um, I also suffered a brain injury. So um, I had neurologic damage. I um, had stroke-like symptoms. Sometimes it still shows up in my voice. And it was an incredibly impactful time because once again, that, that idea of access. Who can access these places and how? And what if you can't? You know, became so uh, personal to me during that time. So I thought, I thought about him. And I came to Oregon, and a little colder, a little murkier, different fish, but um, another incredible place to uh, study marine biology and study ocean systems off our incredible dynamic coast. And um, I'm still doing that today through an incredible collaboration and partnership with many. And we look at juvenile fishes because these are the future of our fisheries. Whatever happens during that early life stage has direct impacts on the fish that we can fish commercially, recreationally, the communities and the livelihoods that they support and also the cultures that they support. Um, these species have been sustaining peoples along our coast for millennia. So incredibly important and um, an incredible need for collaboration. There's a lot of work to be done. Very little is known about what happens during these life stages on our coast. And so I have an incredible um, network of collaborators on this. Um, grad students, some of them in the audience today. Also um, other faculty members. Uh, managers, fishery scientists, local business owners, uh, public educators, an incredible group of people. And um, if you see that picture on the bottom left with people in wetsuits holding what we call Smurf, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, we have also a, a library of wetsuits so that undergrads can come and engage in the research and not need to worry about that barrier of investing in these really expensive tools that they need to have in order to be able to work together. Okay, so SMURFs on the bottom right, uh, that stands for Standard Monitoring Unit for the Recruitment of Fishes. And that's the tool that we use to get these juvenile fish and learn more about them. And we're learning a lot about them, and I don't have time to talk about much of it today, but again, lots of variability and a very obviously changing ocean. And that variability in our ocean, which you see on the right, um, recently encapsulated a heat wave. And that's having impacts on juvenile fishes, not always in the way you would expect, but it seems most of the time with impacts on how many there are and how they'll survive into the future, which of course has impacts on our fisheries as well. And these things that we're seeing in the Florida Keys, we're seeing here, um, they're not isolated. We know that our oceans are experiencing extreme changes, uh, warming waters, 
ocean acidification. The ocean absorbs about a quarter of the carbon dioxide that we as humanity uh, produce, which is fundamentally changing the chemistry of the ocean. And they um, estimate that that's going to, if we don't abate this by 2100, it's going to cause probably like a trillion dollars in losses annually because of aquaculture, because of reefs, because of things that are built on calcifiers that not only uh, sustain our ecosystems, but the people that depend on them. So um, we know we need solutions, and this is a huge part of my work. I want to be involved in the solutions on multiple levels, and part of that is thinking about different tools. So there's lots of different tools and lots of different ways to be engaged in those. Um, the one that I focus on is protected areas in the ocean. These are like parks in the sea. And um, they're areas that are set aside to try and abate some of these impacts, especially extractive and destructive activities. And they're in use and they're placed all around the world with their own uh, challenges and opportunities uh, for equity and justice as well. So I'm getting back to that very shortly. So, um, we know the ocean is changing. These areas are crucially important, but we also don't know a lot about what's, um, what we need to be able to ensure that these MPAs, as we call them, are successful. So um, we led an international working group to ask that question, and you'll see some familiar faces in the bottom left, um, collaborators in this work, uh, especially Jane Lubchenco, who's here with us tonight, and graduate students who now have gone on um, in their own careers as leaders in this space. And what we said is, OK, we know that we're keeping track of how much of the ocean is protected. Let's partner with the global data holders on MPAs. So that's the UN Environment Program. They have a World Conservation Monitoring Center. We partner with them. Um, IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the Red List, all these things you may have heard about, they also keep track of effective ocean protection. And then the Marine Conservation Institute, which takes some of these data, which UNEP has to report, countries report it to them, and kind of vets it and checks it and looks to see you know, what kind of quality protections MPAs might be providing. And we looked across a bunch of different species. They're in place all around the world, lots to learn. A bunch of different habitats. And after a lot of compiling of that information over decades of research, this is what we came up with. This is our graphical abstract. So the graphs behind it I'm not sharing today. But essentially what we found is that in the past, and this wasn't our finding, this is our summary, um, ocean ecosystems tended to look like that. And that's because local communities use the resources. Um, different systems were already in place as kind of checks and balances. But then as technology improved, access and ability to harvest more and more, um, we have a very different reality in the present in terms of our ocean ecosystems and specifically biodiversity in those ecosystems. So MPAs exist, but another thing we found is that MPAs differ widely. And it's because of the activities that are happening in them. We may think, okay, an MPA means an area is set aside and protected. Check mark, that's great. But actually, many MPAs around the world allow industrial fishing or factory fishing. Um, many MPAs um, allow mining and exploration uh, for oil drilling or actual oil drilling. So what happens inside an MPA matters because it has different impacts on the types of biodiversity there and the amount of biodiversity there. So we looked at these different kind of aspects of different types of MPAs and came up with these different categories. So, very effective, very clear. Um, but I have a question for you. What would you say is missing in this graphical abstract? Feel free to raise your hand, throw out a species. Humans. Humans, exactly. Humans are missing. Um, we're not managing fish species underwater. We're not managing coral. We're managing people. Um, but it's about more than that. That's really top down. It's about the integral connections between biodiversity and humanity. Humans are part of biodiversity, actually. So how are we accounting for this? And what a moment. We had some colleagues ask us this. And we thought, OK, 
Good point. We're a bunch of ecologists, biologists, physical scientists um, compiling this information, but um, where are the people? There's such a crucial part of these, these systems that are not only ecological, but social as well. And so um, we had some work to do. Uh, this is about 40%, I think, of our working group. Um, and it was really obvious that even though we had reached out to social scientists and um, there you know, were a couple in the working group, it was nowhere near the type of expertise and the types of um, hypothesis generating, question asking that we needed to do together from the very beginning. So at that point, we pressed pause and we um, looked at our community and changed it to have social scientists who could help bring, who would bring that expertise to this kind of work. And so I'm only putting one in the bottom right, that's because it's Anna Spalding and she is another um, OSU professor and social scientist in the School of Public Policy and anthropologist. So it, it took us a year and um, that pause you know, had that reality associated with it. But in the end, um, what we developed as a science framework, um, we're calling the MPA Guide. And our logo now is not only just fish, we got a person in there now too. <laughs> so this is the MPA Guide. And essentially we worked also really hard with the communication specialists who are part of our community and to think about how to distill this science, really complex, actually a lot of volume behind it, into things that could be easily used. And so on the right, don't try to read it, it's fuzzy. But essentially what it does is walk you through, like here are the different types of activities, is this happening in your area, like what are the impacts? And you end up with a estimate of what kind of protection level you have, and then we've got a whole table behind it about what kinds of outcomes for biodiversity would be likely because of that. We also, with the leadership of our social science colleagues, dived really deeply into the enabling conditions. Of course, the activities, whether there's fishing, whether there's mining, um, whether there's recreation, whatever, has a role. But actually, um, how humans interact with the process, how they lead the process, how equitable is that process, how transparent, how collaborative, terms you recognize from our IB community values, how are those incorporated in the work also? Because they're equally important for the success of these areas for biodiversity conservation. So it became a really important part of the work. So in the end, um, it's a little blurry, bummer, but um, I wanted you to know that it resulted in a publication and um, that came out in 2021. And um, it has 42 co-authors from 38 institutions in 16, 13 countries, six continents. We missed out on Antarctica, but we cut ourselves some slack on that one. Um, and um, it's incredible to see that that dialogue, well, first, to just to be honest, the social ecological is why we were able to publish this in science. That approach um, was part of the transformative uh, piece of our work. And um, we're just especially proud of the bottom right, you probably can't read it, but more members of the public have downloaded this paper than scientists, which makes me super happy. And you can see the different countries also that people are accessing it from. So uh, that's the MPA guide. But what do, what do we do with it then? Um, I'm really happy to share just a little tidbit about um, a way OSU students engage with this work. So during the testing phases of different aspects of this project, um, Jane and I co-taught a Z599 class um, and students took commitments that global leaders, countries, industries, other organizations, um, billionaires <laughs> had made towards ocean protection and use the MPA guide to say, okay, What's the return on investment? Are these leaders actually returning on their commitments? Is it just lip service because they're standing on a big important stage? What's actually happening? And um, it was an incredible process. It was led by um, two grad student kind of mentors and TAs. Um, Jenna Sullivan Stack is here, at least she was, and she's still um, working and doing this work at OSU. Um, but now at this point, we've been invited back to this high level invitation only um, meeting of commitments called Our Ocean, started by John Kerry when he's in the State Department, um, to report how are we doing on our commitments. 
And pretty incredibly, um, what we found in our last go round is that 70% of commitments have actually been completed, which was a little bit surprising. I think we all went in kind of like, let's get them. But in the end, <laughs> people were showing up and putting um, investment and resources behind it. Um, but there's still more work to be done. So we also know that um, progress has been made. Most of them have been completed. Almost all commitments to MPAs or other area-based management show evidence of progress. But we need um, the rest to be completed. Right now, 2.5% of the ocean has been protected as a result of these commitments. And that's you know, high or full protection. And if all the commitments were completed and um, in this forum and in other fora, nine, more than 9% of the ocean would be protected which uh, may not sound so impressive, but hold on to that thought for just a second. Okay, so the MPA guide is being used in many ways. We have a member of our team, Katie Bear Nalvin, who's working right now with manager networks around the world to learn from their perspectives on MPAs, adapt the MPA guide, think more about how it can be useful, um, but it's being used in many ways. So in the end, this story is really about transdisciplinarity, and this is something that um, we're talking about a lot right now in the college and the university. And um, I love this graphic because as things get more and more meshed, you know, just add on time, relationship building, you know, transdisciplinarity is starting from the beginning or starting from scratch, taking a step back and thinking, um, how can we do better and how we ask these questions? Because we have to if we're trying to find solutions that are going to benefit both people um, and biodiversity. So our research group thinks a lot about this, and we think a lot about merging science with management, with policy, and thinking about how that can be useful and holding ourselves accountable to that. So these are some of the amazing members of the team. Uh, Jenna Sullivan-Stack on the top, Katie Baranalvin, Jason Seipel, Bonnie Many, and Cameron Royer. We have new collaborators joining soon. And um, just doing a little accounting of across the projects, across our ongoing collaborations right now, these are the different areas of expertise that our collaborators are bringing to this goal for transdisciplinarity. And it's been amazing. So more about that some other time. And so that brings us to our final story, which is really a story for the future. And that's because, in the end, um, everything that we've been talking about, but back to this idea especially of who we are, who we represent, who we're welcoming in, how we're being moral and responsible about that, um, is a crucial part of how we move forward in our science and in our solutions. So this story starts in another room. And this room is a lot more rarefied than Zoom. Um, this is the United Nations, and this is um, the room where the Convention on Biological Diversity is discussed and debated and commitments decided around. So this is a group of decision makers who had been working for multiple years, and in this case, multiple days. Days, in fact, without sleep. The UN is hardcore. Like, once they get into negotiations, you can't stop, so people tag out, they nap, they run out to use the bathroom and get food, but in the end, negotiations are ongoing around the clock to get to consensus about how we're gonna move forward. And remember all those things outlined in that report, there's an urgency to moving forward, and that's why these negotiations were continuing in this way. And what these negotiations ended up with in De on December 19th of 2022, is a new set of commitments and targets to biodiversity on our planet. And so this UN Convention on Biological Diversity has a number of new targets. And um, permit me a couple of bullets to focus on what's called target three. And that's because the wording is really important. This word is to protect at least 30% of both the land and sea by 2030. It includes coastal and marine areas, which is my area of interest. Um, but they should be effectively conserved and managed. They should be equitably governed. And they should recognize and respect the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. So I think we all 
can get behind that language and agree with it, but actually having a convention on biological diversity incorporate human rights is a huge advancement. It's never happened before. And so when this set of agreements, this framework was um, signed, many tears because that actually represents an incredible step forward in the signing. Now we have implementation. So with that in mind, how are we doing? Where are we at the moment? Well, where are we towards 30%? Remember I said 9% of the ocean could be protected. Right now, UNEP reports 8.28% of the ocean protected. A long way from 30%. How about effectiveness? Um, well, of that 8.28%, um, we've been running analyses of most of that in the 100 largest MPAs. A quarter is not actually implemented, which means um, even though it says on paper things are happening for whatever reason, and it's not always shame and blame. It might be lack of resources or um, lack of equitable processes. It's not implemented. It's not even achieving conservation. And a third of that area actually allows industrial activities, which was very surprising, as we said. Factory fishing, oil drilling, mining, exploration, um, all these are happening, and we have a paper that's in review right now about that. And what about equity? Well, that's severely understudied, and traditional knowledge and wisdom is largely not incorporated. So that's our work for the future. So um, we have a new working group focused on conserved areas, and again, working with our partners as the global data holders on area conservation in the ocean, and now adding in other organizations that bring in these facets of you know, more than just MPAs, but other areas that could be established for something other than biodiversity conservation, but they could be effective in various ways. So sectors, we have FAO, um, the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, their fisheries um, department is part of this process. Also, the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity, peoples who are um, negotiating and advocating for rights to their sovereignty over their traditional lands and waters. Um, and our team, Jenna and Bonnie, and also this amazing group of collaborators there, just a portion of them are engaged in this work. So this took us to the UN um, last November, and we had the amazing opportunity of seeing um, by um, invitation of our colleagues at the um, Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity, um, the first Indigenous co-chair um, designated in the CBD. And also the negotiations that are happening around it, and it, there's fierce conversations right now. Um, we have collaborators here in this picture who have invited us into these conversations with so much generosity and an amazing welcoming spirit, and we hold that very strongly in our heart, the responsibility of working together. Because the next frontier is, how do we take our science on a spreadsheet and combine it with indigenous science? Other ways of knowing and understanding impacts and biodiversity over time, and how do we take those ways of knowing and apply it to what we want to really achieve um, with, these, with these products. So here are some of our um, colleagues. Olga Sek is Maya from Belize. Um, that's Chrissy Grant. Next to her, um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander from Australia. Onel Masardule, who's Kuna from Panama. And um, dear friend and colleague Viviana Figueroa, who is Amawaka Koya from Argentina. So we're very excited about that work, and it's ongoing. So um, interweaving EJI is always a process. This um, starting with these community values, thinking about how it informs um, our community here, um, our teaching, our mentoring, all the different interwoven aspects of our identities as um, OSU community members is an ongoing process, and IB has been such an amazing home to have these conversations. And also the ripple effect is happening. What an amazing opportunity to see how those conversations, they were hard at times and they were very frank and honest, 
um, really led to a set of community values and practices and actions that are rippling even beyond OSU. They're in our departments, they're in our college, they're in our university, but each of us um, is bringing in our own way to our networks outside. So whether it's thinking about our science in a way that um, you know, is seeking solutions and having that humility and willingness to develop relationships to address some of these policy issues in community together, and also just the opportunity to, for the next generation of scientists, also welcome them into some of these spaces and have them participate in these conversations and in getting in the water too. So I just wanted to end by uh, thinking about the future. One opportunity, we just started it in IB, is a give, IB Beeves Give campaign to um, create some resources for some of these student experiences. So field gear, um, the opportunity to go along on some of these um, field trips or policy engagements to learn and to create their own networks and to think about how this experiential learning is so um, crucial to how we think about ourselves as scientists and finding a place in science. So yeah, I hope you'll think about that too. So thank you so much for this time that we've had together to talk about these topics. I wanna to thank all my communities, including my funders. And I wanted to make sure to put up this slide because um, that's been a journey also, thinking about this work and support for this work and finding funding partners who um, have the resources and the commitment to this type of work too. And each of these organizations is bringing that. And we've collaborated with all of them in many ways. So thank you so much. presentation. Um, can we give Kristen one more round of applause? Um, so now we'll start the Q&A. We have some time. Uh, we have microphones at each side of the room. Um, if you want to raise your hand and ask a question, we'll bring you a microphone. We'll open it up. Thank you, Christian. Uh, I have an inconvenient question about uh, marine uh, ecology, which is related to the, you know, nuclear waste. You know, before 1995, I think most countries dumped their nuclear waste mm -hmm. in the oceans. Some of them actually did there near their shores. You know, is there is that related to our research? Or is that mm -hmm. an active topic? Oh. What a great question and a really important question because these are super fun sites in the ocean, right? And when we think about the impacts that the super fun sites have had on communities on land, uh, many communities are just as tied to the ocean in these ocean places. We used to think that some of them are so far offshore, right? They're never going to influence us. It's not the case. The ocean's very connected and um, a special, a lot of traditional uses we're far flung in the oceans. The high seas is traditional lands and territories and waters. Um, so I hear you. It's not part of this research is the short answer, but um, this idea of what's abatable by marine protected areas and what's not is an important part of this conversation. These are not the solution to everything that's happening in the ocean. It's part of that multiple solutions approach. And so discussing how these areas impact areas around them and how it can be abated and also recognizing the responsibility, right? Areas in the ocean um, need to be stewarded and mitigated as with areas on land. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. This has been so interesting. Um, a really basic question for you. How is it decided what area becomes a marine protected area? Is it geography, biodiversity, something else entirely? 
thank you. And that's something that I didn't have time to talk about today, but again, integrally connected with equity and justice, because there's many different answers to that question. And um, they run the gamut of everything from, these are traditional practices that have been um, conserved and stewarded and continued for millennia and actually are recognized as marine protected areas because of their um, inherent and proven track record for biological um, conservation of diversity, all the way through to what we call fortress conservation, where it's um, outside entities come and have a top-down approach to setting aside an area without consulting local communities or recognizing the sovereignty of rights holders. So there's a huge gamut on the governance side, let's say, that's the answer I gave. You asked a question about biodiversity and habitat and you know how do we decide. There's a lot of different approaches to that. We just published a paper looking at biodiversity um, in US waters and how it's distributed. It doesn't always line up with MPAs and that's because we don't always have the perfect information about where an MPA should be to maximize. And so now the technology and such is moving towards that um, reality and that goal, but the two have to go hand in hand. Where's the biodiversity and what is equitable governance and respecting human rights in that area? So thank you for that. And also, if no questions, it would be great if people want to share experiences or personal diversity statements. Anything you want to share, <laughs> if you have <laughs> other things. Yeah, definitely. Sorry. Thanks. Um, so you talked a lot about incorporating indigenous perspectives and the perspectives of the humans in these regions but there must be times when what those humans want is not 100% concordant with the conservation goals of the white people who are running the whole process. How do you approach that? How does that work? How could it work better? Yeah, the agreement and consensus but, and the justice associated with that. You know, it's there's such a myriad of needs for these conversations to happen right and morally, I would use that word. Um, part of it is thinking about the whole spectrum of use and location. So I didn't talk about it today, but there are other targets beyond target three. And some of those are for um, equitable access to sustainable fisheries, to restoration, to there's a whole target about incorporating traditional knowledge and wisdom. So really, target three gets a lot of focus because it's the one target with a number. And so everyone's all about the number. But actually, each of the other targets is just as important and incredibly intertwined. So with those conversations that you raise, I think it's looking at trade-offs and other things and recognizing there needs to be space for everything. And the last thing I would say that science can uh, not dictate, of course, but provide, there's an event horizon, right? There's lots of different options, actually, different maximizing your return on investment options. So presenting those and then having the conversation about trade-offs with local users and rights holders is kind of a way you can bring that together to at least work towards justice. Yeah, thank you. Um, hopefully this will turn up. Perfect. Mm. Um, you spent a little bit of time talking about decolonizing ecology. Mm. Could you give run through that and kind of give some examples of, of what that actually looks like in practice? Yeah. yeah. We had a great conversation about it um, in this discussion group. So it happened during the summer, like I said, and there were multiple topics. So for example, one topic was um, museum collection. And we learned a lot from our um, departmental expert on those topics. There's a lot of things happening about repatriation. Um, samples that were taken from one area, um, how do we repatriate them? There's a lot of issues associated with that. Um, but it's a very real way that kind of the way science is built is on some of these collections and not all of those collections may have been um, just. 
Also, we talked a lot about um, parachute science, um, which is this idea of you know, you're based in a place, that's your home, but you go to another place to do research, you zoom in, you do that research, maybe you're using some local folks to support you. I'm thinking about some histories we probably all know about both land and sea. And then zooming away again, no attribution, no resources shared, um, no acknowledgement of the deep knowledge of the people who are helping you. Um, and so a lot of that is in, you know, what we might think of past colonial times, but it can still happen. So we talked a lot about authorship and um, <clears throat> the uh, intellectual property rights. So in our work with IFB, that's always first and foremost. Who owns this information? Who gets to share it? Who gets to decide how it is portrayed? Um, those kind of things are procedural, but they're totally crucial for moving forward. Thank you. Uh, so I apologize, um, but uh, first off, it's a mind trip to have been one of your eCampus ecology students and now here working for the department. Um, so I think as an advisor, um, we work with a lot of students and have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations and something we're trying to break down is what is conservation. A lot of students come in and they have this one idea. Your talk really touched on marine conservation and environmental policy with these marine protected areas, what would be something you would want to share that we advisors could share with our students on like really branching out to think what marine conservation is? Because it's not just straight biological or ecological. ecological. Yeah. Yeah, what a great question. Thanks. And thanks for being in my class. Those were <laughs> good times in ecology. Um, I deserve that B. <laughs> um, I think I would say is a lot of times we think about species, think about your systems. That's kind of a nice entry point to thinking about this and it's part of kind of my process too. Where does your species live? Who lives around it? What communities live around it? Who um, are the people asking questions about it? Who are the people relying on it for their livelihoods? And that kind of narrative building, I think, is really important. Because before long, you scale up, right? Who's making the decisions? Who gets to make the decisions? Who probably should be making the decisions, but has systemic inequities preventing them from? And before you know it, marine conservation is this incredible kind of microcosm of these issues, and it's been amazing to engage in them, very humbling. Like, I'm not an expert in any of those things, but partnering with our um, collaborators who are, it's the most exciting thing ever. I mean, to be able to work in this space with people whose expertise is so additive, but so different, um, I hope students can get excited about that because that relationship building and that community that grows is, yeah, one of my favorite parts. Few more questions. Cool. Thank you all for your great questions. I will turn things over to um, Dean Feingold to finish things out. And I'm just going to finish things out by thanking everyone for being here again, thanking our speaker, thanking Cameron. This is such a great example of some of the incredible work and some of the incredible thought that goes into the work that's going on in the College of Science. Um, I hope it's ins been as inspiring to everyone else as it has been to me. And then I put in a final plug for coming back in a couple weeks to hear more exciting things about what your colleagues in the College of Science are doing when we do our 2024 awards ceremony on February 29th. So please join me again in thanking everyone. Thank you.